I should say that first of all, um, my point of giving this talk uh, primarily was to um, drum up interest among the students of this university, of Ilya University, for the courses that, that I'm teaching in, in, uh, in Soviet political history. Um, if you are from Ilya University, and there's maybe a couple of are from, actually are from there, uh, there'll be information about that at the end of this, this slideshow, which is, is going automatically. Um, this presentation of this talk is, is based not on one particular project, but actually on, on four articles that, that I've been working on for the past seven years or so. Um, two of them are, are published so far, uh, and two of them are, are um, not yet published. One of them is, is forthcoming, and the other one is, is written, but not reviewed yet. But uh, my interest in Apazia, um, like for many people, I think, is, is one that um, begins in the contemporary period or with, with what one finds upon coming here or upon living here, um, and then sort of goes, goes backwards. Um, and I think that's actually the, the way that most of us approach Apazia, even if we're from here and even if we've uh, been here a long time, even if we've lived through many of these events. Um, it's a, one of those things sort of like, a, um, like an onion shell, that you open it up and it gets sort of more and more complex the further you look into it. Uh, and for that reason, I'm going to do something kind of unusual today, which is to give what's basically a, a talk about history, um, but, but to do it backwards. Uh, and instead of starting in one place and, and coming, going forward, I'm going to do the opposite and go back into history, um, sort of in the way that my own interest and my own research has um, exposed me to it. Um, so to begin with, though, why, why Apazia? Most people who are interested in Apazia, again, both those who are here and, and who come from the outside, um, are interested in Apazia because, because it was a conflict, because it's an unresolved conflict, because it's such an interesting thing in terms of geopolitics, the relationship between Russia and Georgia, the, um, the, the legacy of the collapse of the Soviet Union and that sort of thing. Um, that wasn't really my interest, actually. I've never written anything about the war, about the conflict directly, or about the causes of, of the war, about the causes of the conflict. It's, it's not my direct interest, although it's something that's sort of inescapable in dealing with something like Abhazia. Um, the more you look back, again, the more things sort of jump out at you and say, well, maybe this is a uh, approximate cause, or maybe this is a deeper cause of, of why things ended up the way they did. And ultimately, that, that is sort of a, the most interesting question, I think, about the, the conflict. Why, uh, why did things get so bad? Why did um, relations break down to such an extent that people started to kill each other once the Soviet Union fell apart? Um, and when you go back in history, that uh, that's one of the things that strikes you as interesting about Abhazia, that you can sort of see, again, going backwards, the development of how uh, conflicts emerged, how things, particular things, became particularly important. Um, when you first approach Abhazia, uh, again, even for those who have, uh, who have ex lived, experienced those things from a first-hand point of view, have lived through those events, what, what strikes you is that um, this was a, a conflict that had a lot to do with, with symbols and a lot to do with, with history and a lot to do with how things were imagined and how things were interpreted, which as an outsider especially was, was sort of interesting. Um, when, when I first came to Georgia and became sort of aware of, of Abhazia and, and, and what happened in the conflict and looking at that, and you sort of see it, it's, it's unusual in the sense that uh, what strikes you when you first look at, say, the 1980s in the, the area preceding the conflict, uh, and even going back, say, into the 1970s and the 1960s, is uh, how many of the things that they were fighting about were, were seen to be symbolic. It wasn't really about um, power relations per se, but there were arguments about, about history, for example. The war in Apazi was fought by historians before it was fought by, by soldiers, and by warring interpretations, by different uh, books that were written or documents that were published, and interpretations about what that history meant. Uh, it was a conflict that was seen to be in, in this period before the actual conflict broke out with physical violence, uh, one about things that seemed purely symbolic, uh, things like um, number of dance ensembles, or whether we have a TV tower or we don't have a TV tower, whether we have radio or we don't have radio, how many textbooks are published in our language, um, how many, uh, what opportunities do people have for higher education, for publishing, for promotion in academies of sciences, how much funding is given to the, uh, to the Gulia Institute for Abhazian Language and Culture as opposed to uh, the Georgian ones. All these things which seem, um, on the face of them, to be not, not political, 
Uh, of course, the more one becomes involved in uh, the study of Soviet nationality policies and the way that sort of played out more recently, you sort of see the way in which um, the, the non-political became politicized and <clears throat> the way in which the basic Soviet nationalities approach to uh, ethnic, ethnic identity was to, uh, to allow these symbolic things and to, uh, rather to allow the nationalities to allow the ethnic groups to have control of these things which are purely cultural in exchange, theoretically, for giving up control of those things which were political. And what ultimately resulted from that, of course, and this, there's a long, um, a long uh, literature about this, is the way in which the cultural became politicized. So by trying to take power away from the things that were actually political, um, they actually ended up giving it to those things which were cultural. And those things which were cultural uh, indicators uh, became indicators of status within a political hierarchy, within a political competition. So that's one of the reasons that, that Apasia becomes very interesting is because it shows in very stark contrast the way that these sort of things played out in real life. Um, Apasia is also, I think, interesting because, first of all, it's just a really interesting place. If you're looking at these pictures that are flashing by, these are the pictures that, these are my, most of my own pictures, are the, uh, the ones that aren't pictures of people are, are the ones that I took 10 years ago, I think in 2003, the first time I went there. Um, it's a really beautiful place. It's also ethnically very interesting. Um, in the documents of the debates of the 1920s when they're talking about all these different ethnicities and how are we going to deal with all these ethnicities, um, somebody referred to it as uh, a, a miniature League of Nations. So you had a very unusual situation. You had lots of different languages, lots of different ethnicities. Um, at the same time, you had an intersection of things that were going on in the Soviet system which make it really interesting both to historians and to political scientists, and I sort of pretend at being one or the other, um, depending on who I'm talking to. Um, but from both of those point of view, points of view, um, you see really interesting things that happen in, and that are represented in Abkhazia that you can then extract to the, to the more general picture of, of how the Soviet system works. And the things that stand out as most interesting, I think, uh, in relation to that are um, this sort of interplay of nationality policy, of Soviet nationality policy, and the legacy and implications of that. Uh, and clientelism, or patron-client relations, or informal, informal mechanisms of distribution and, and control. And so my interest in Abhazia and my research and my work in Abhazia has been about really ultimately those, those things, about the intersection of those two things, and about how Abhazia can then be abstracted to the larger Soviet system in general. Um, the periphery has sort of become particularly uh, fashionable among historians and among geographers. Um, but the peripheries of empires are interesting, the peripheries of anything are interesting. Uh, in the same way that physicists like to study uh, the law, how the laws of physics behave on the, on the outskirts of the universe, or the, of the edges of the known universe, um, to see if, if, if there are exceptions possible there, then that affects how we can interpret the rules of physics everywhere else. And the same thing I think is true with periphery of empire and the periphery of the Soviet empire more particularly, that the exceptions that we find in a place like Carpazia um, sort of tell us a lot about how the system actually functioned or what was actually possible under, under the Soviet system. So, I've already started going backwards by sort of beginning in the 1980s and in the 1970s and the way these sort of symbolic things became politicized about how those things um, became the, the precedent or the, 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 some of the, the, the leading causes for the actual breakout of hostilities when, when the, the Soviet system collapsed. Um, if you look at that period in, the, say, the 1960s to the 1980s, of the high Soviet period, the late Soviet period, um, you also see um, ethnic identity being something very fixed, that people are very sure about what a Georgian is and what an Abhaz is. That there's, uh, among academics, um, there's the basic theory is that to some assumed is sort of ethnogenesis, that uh, nations are primordial, that they are created as they were from the beginning of time, the reflections of how God created the world, and they're that way now. One of the reasons that that period, I think, of Soviet history is, is particularly interesting is that uh, in the peripheries, you see how local intellectuals were able to essentially hijack the, the instruments of the state, the resources of the state, um, to continue to tell this story of, of national identification of, of national um, of national identity um, really continuing the projects that had begun in the late 19th century um, in Georgia and in, in Eurasia and else, elsewhere in Europe of, of creating national identity of going out and sort of finding those things which define an ethnic group 
of, uh, of codifying those things. And in the periphery, you had uh, intellectuals doing that in official institutions, right? Using the resources of the state. Uh, and that's what they were doing in these, these institutes of, of, histori of, of, histo of history, of, of ethnicity, uh, rather, of, of ethnology, of archaeology, of, of language, of linguistics. Um, and the state allowing that. Of course, there were limits to what you could do. Um, you had to keep things um, more or less uh, within official strictures, not too much religion, not too much anti-Russianness, but as long as, you, uh, as long as you kept things more or less under, under some control. And especially if you did it in, non, uh, in, in local languages, you could get, get away with quite a lot. But it was really about defining these, these ethnic categories which were assumed to be uh, primordial, or pre presumed to be um, ethnically genetic. One of the dangers, I think, of, of dealing with something like Abhazia is um, because of that history and because of the conflict that happened later, um, there's always a problem or a temptation when you're looking back at this history to projecting the things that we know today or the assumptions of today back on those times. Knowing that a conflict happened, knowing that these identities were seen as fixed in the late Soviet period. Um, there's this temptation, and I think it, it happens um, all across the board with, with outside uh, researchers, also with local researchers on both sides, of sort of assuming that that was the situation then, that these things were fixed, that these things were, were essential when you look back at the previous periods. In the 1960s, actually even going back before that, from the, um, from the end of the Stalin period, so today is the, the 60th anniversary of the death of Stalin, um, on March 5th, 1953, um, after, the, um, after the period of de-Stalinization, after the secret speech of Khrushchev in 1956, um, with a sort of semi-liberalization, the sort of, um, uh, and especially in Georgia after the events of, um, of March 1956. This is when this period basically began, of local peripheral ethnicities uh, being able to use these resources of the state for their own national projects. Um, this is also a period when you had um, a series of conflicting complaints from Abhaz and from Georgians about each other, particularly in Abhazia, um, that had, again, had to do with interpretation of history and in some cases had to do with interpretation of, of more recent events during the Stalin period. Um, this is the period of the, uh, when the Abhaz uh, intelligentsia themselves were doing the same things that the Georgians were doing, but their definition of self in many ways had to do with their rejection of those things or their perception of oppression um, from, the point, from what had been done to them by the Georgians. And you had a series of, of letters that were written in between, starting in 1947, but really sort of reaching their peak in the 1960s and 1970s. Um, they were published in 1990 in, in one volume. Maybe you've seen this, the Abkhazki Pisma. Um, this is Sport uh, Document of Tomadin. There was only a Tomadin. There was never any more publications. This is the only one. Um, but it has all of these um, letters that were written by Abhaz uh, scholars and intellectuals. Uh, and the interesting thing is that they were all written in Russian and they were all written to, to Moscow. They weren't written to Tbilisi. They were sent to Moscow. Which always, already showed something rather interesting in this relationship. Here you had a uh, what was a subordinate unit within a republic, right? So it was an a ASSSR, an autonomous republic within the Georgian Republic. Um, formerly subordinated to the capital of the republic, right? To Tbilisi. And here they are sending all of these letters to Moscow, a direct line to Moscow, complaining about what was happening. So we already see that what would eventually become a characteristic of the later uh, Abhaz-Georgian conflict that it, it wasn't a dyad, it wasn't a dyadic relationship, it wasn't a two-sided relationship between uh, the Georgians and the Apas. It was always a three-sided one, with, with three um, apexes and three points to it, with Tbilisi, Sukhumi, and, and Moscow. This was, of course, also the period of um, the, um, the conflict within, among academics, about, uh, again, ethnogenesis. The, the, the Ingerokva scandal, the writings of Bertsenashvili, um, these arguments about where the Abhas come, came from, um, did they really, were they the original Abhas, did they come, were they uh, Circassians who came down from the mountains and replaced whoever had been the real Abhas who had been there before, who were ethnically Georgian, um, did the fact that they didn't have a written language mean uh, that they weren't, um, didn't have 
formal status of nationality. You can see actually how this whole argument begins to play into the, the categories of Soviet nationality policies. It's sort of targeted towards those things um, because there were specific definitions within the concepts of ethnogenesis within Soviet nationality policy about what makes a nation. And your, uh, the degree to which you fit that means the degree to which you can get the privileges associated with uh, Soviet nationality policy. So by saying that, for example, the Apas don't have a language, um, that's already striking at one of the p key pillars of what the Soviet, uh, or the definition of nationality is under Soviet nationality policy. I'll admit though that this, this period, the 1960s, say to the 1980s, um, is the period that personally I've dealt with, with the least. I've, I've never written anything about it. It's something I've already sort of skipped over. Um, but it's one I think that's an inevitable legacy of the things that happened before it. So then to push back Further, what seems to have set up most of the complaints that are written in the Zapaski Pisma um, is, are the things that took place during the previous period, uh, and that is the, the Stalin period, which from the Abkhazian point of view um, meant the domination of Georgians over the Abkhaz. And they see this to this day as the period of their suffering, the period of their repression. Um, this in part sort of ties into the de-Stalinization campaigns and the, the, um, the, the way in, in which that uh, approach was sort of centered all of the complaints about what was happening in the Soviet period in the Stalin times on specifically Stalin and Beria. And from the Georgian point of view, this is all about Beria. They, always, they refer to it as the Beria of China, as the period of Beria's rep repressive. Um, The first article that I wrote about Apazi was actually about, really about this period, about the high Stalinist period. Um, what struck me about it as most interesting, though, was not the actual repressions, although those were interesting as well, uh, and the, the sort of relationship between Georgians and Russians, but um, what really got me interested, first of all, in that was this um, biography that was written by Akaki Mangaladze. And Akaki Mangaladze was, um, was the party chief in Apazia uh, from 1943 up until uh, his promotion in 1951. Uh, in 1951, he was then promoted to being the sort of local, uh, the head of not just Abkhazia, but also the, uh, the head of the combined Kutaisi district, which also then included Abkhazia. Stalin redistricted Georgia very briefly in 1951. So it uh, actually put it back into the Tsarist definition, where you had the Tbilisi and the Kutaisi districts. Uh, Akaki Mugaladze was then promoted to that, and then after that, very shortly after that, and later in 1951, he was then promoted to being the, the first secretary of the Georgian Communist Party. So he was the party boss uh, in Apazia, actually 1952, actually, after uh, Charkoviani was removed um, under Stalin. And he wrote a, a biography, actually, he was probably almost illiterate himself. He, he, he narrated this to his wife, who was an ethnic Russian, who wrote it uh, in Russian. And Mikhailadze was such a Stalinist that his, his own autobiography uh, was called Stalin Kakim Yayevoznal. This is the story of, of Mikhailadze's own life, Stalin as I knew him. Um, which, and there's a lot of uh, panegyrics about Stalin, but um, what was really interesting about it is how he describes the things that he did in Abkhazia during his time in Abkhazia, and about how he came to be in Abkhazia, and be the party chief in Abkhazia. Uh, as I said, he was appointed in 1943. Uh, he describes how he was, uh, he received a phone call from Stalin directly. And Stalin said, I need you to go to Abkhazia and to take over because uh, in this war, we're fighting this war with tobacco. Our, the Red Army runs on tobacco. Uh, Abkhazia is one of the major producers of tobacco. We need to increase the crop. We need a good man there. So you're going there to be party, to be uh, the first secretary. Uh, and so he went there. What's really interesting about this, uh, these autobiography is how Mugalate talks about uh, how he was able to personally deal with Stalin in order to get things done. And this happens over and over again. It's not something he's bragging about, really. He's just sort of talking about, well, I thought we needed this. I thought we needed a new embankment road. Or I thought we needed investment in the harbor. Or, or one thing or another. And he said, well, uh, and I just talked to Stalin and, and said, let's, let's do it. And Stalin said, you, you have my approval. And it was done. Um, which brings up an interesting, one of the other reasons why, why Abhazi is particularly interesting. And that is, uh, the fact that it is such a nice place, and it's a, it's a, a sanatorial region, uh, and it's a place, place where the elites came, uh, and it's a place where local officials had face time with the really important leaders. Stalin had dachas there, several dachas there, and he would come very often. Khrushchev had dachas, Gorbachev, everybody had dachas there, um, or nearby, or in Sochi. The line wasn't so, uh, so, so strict, you could go up back and forth. But it meant that you could actually sit down with these people, 
and get things done. So that already says something really interesting about the functioning of the Soviet system, right? There, we might assume that this grand bureaucratic structure with all of these rules and formal procedures uh, might or should function in a more uh, formal way. But here we see this happening over and over again, where a local party chief, merely by the fact of having the ability to speak with the local leader, with, with the major leaders, getting resources, being able to get things done, getting access, um, and how important that was for, for doing things. One of the interesting things that also uh, appears if you look more closely at the, the period of, of rule of Mughaladze, and again, like I said, he was the, the head in, in Abkhazia during the high Stalin period. So from 1943, and he only went up from there until 1953 when he was removed after Stalin died. Um, this was the period where the nasty things that were done to the Abkhaz really got underway. Those things that the Abkhaz themselves blame on Mughaladze uh, sorry, blame on Beria, really were done under Mughaladze. Um, collectivization really took off after 1943. And again, part of it had to do with this, the need for crops, particularly tobacco, but also citrus crops. Um, Abkhazia had been a malarial swamp um, before the Soviet period. The swamps were drained starting at the turn of the century, but really only completed in the 1930s. And it was during really the 1940s when uh, they were creating these large-scale um, collective farms in order to produce these things on a massive scale, which also coincided with the policy of resettlement, of bringing in people. And most of the people that were, they were bringing in were, were coming from, from Georgia. Most of them were, that were coming in were coming from, uh, from Abkhazia, or sorry, from Mingrelia. And most of those collective farms were located in the southern parts, where, those, uh, where the conditions for growing those things are, are more advantageous, where the soil is better for that. Uh, so, Gali district. Uh, and that's where these Georgians were being moved in. Um, the northern districts, of course, are, are much different, and that's where in Patsunda, Gagda, that's where the, the resorts, the beaches are. The southern, different, the southern region isn't, isn't quite so pretty, but it's more productive. Uh, and that's where most of these collective farms were, were placed. Um, but, so it is true that there was a massive population resettlement that took place, which really altered uh, the, or furthered the ethnic dominance of, of Georgians within the Republic. Um, but that was happening on a political level as well, and particularly, again, during the Mughaladze period. If you look at party um, um, enlistment rates, which I've done, and, and you can find those in the article I wrote in 2007, you can see that the Georgians, Georgians really spiked between uh, the mid-1940s up until 1953. The percentage of Georgians in the party became massively disproportionate and very, very strong. And the number of Abkhaz uh, in, in uh, the party leadership positions decreased. So really, that period is rightly seen by the Abkhaz as a period of political domination of of Georgians, of Georgian patronage networks, and again, ma mainly based around Mughaladze. Um, Mughaladze's own patronage relationships are, I think, interesting in, in and of themselves. Um, uh, Dr. Fairbanks, who's here, wrote a, a classic article about Georgia in the, mid, the later 1950s, 1953 to 1957, if I remember right. Uh, and he was talking about how um, the patronage network sort of played out in, uh, in Georgia. And one of the things that uh, Charles had difficulty explaining was exactly where Mughaladze fitted in. Um, I think you can make a fairly strong argument that what happened with Mughaladze was something very rare, but was something which actually did happen, which is it's a rare case in which Stalin himself was directly controlling the local patron. He didn't do this very often. There are only a few other cases. I think one other possible one is Melnikov in Ukraine. We briefly tried to set up. Um, but you can see, I, I think, rather, what, what was happening was that um, Abhazi was important in the bigger power games going on in the Soviet Union at that time uh, because Beria was important and because Georgia and the Caucasus were one of the bases of Beria's patronage network. Abhazi was sort of the soft underbelly of, uh, of Beria's patronage network. Up until 1943, his people were there. Um, after 1943, Mughaladze came in. He, he had a, uh, was independent of Beria. He had his own network of people. Many of them were local. Uh, and he created his own network in Abkhazia that could be the, a counterweight, a counterbalance to, um, to Beria's um, patronage network more generally in the Caucasus. And that's what Stalin was slowly doing as he moved Mughaladze to become first secretary um, of the Georgian party. This was part of what many historians sort of now assume was Stalin's more general plan in 1953, had he lived longer than March 5th. Um, what, that he planned really another, if not a massive purge, then a, a turnover of the leadership. He had already expanded the size of the presidium of the Politburo. Uh, we had brought in 33 new people 
the old party leaders, including Beria and Khrushchev, and people like that sort of saw their days as numbered and uh, saw these new men that Stalin was bringing in as sort of their replacements. Mikheladze was one of these people. He was then brought up to, uh, into the Central Committee and was going to be brought into this new presidium. And you can sort of, the proof of that is the fact that once Stalin died, Mikheladze is one of those who was immediately thrown out, immediately removed from his positions. Um, he ended up um, being sent to be the chief of a, of a, uh, a collective farm in Corelli, where he spent the rest of his career. So he didn't do too badly, he didn't get executed or, or meet, a, meet a worse end, but that sort of ignominious uh, end to somebody who had been rising, had been a high-flying player in, in Soviet uh, patronage politics up to that point. Under Miglatze also you had the uh, linguistic policies, which I think are one of the really root causes of the discontent of Abkhaz intellectuals in later decades. Uh, and that was the forced changes to education and language policies that were done under Mughaladze in 1944 to 1956, uh, when essentially they made all of the schools uh, convert to uh, either Abhaz or uh, Georgian language. In, in essence, they made it illegal for the Abhaz to send their kids to, to Russian schools, which, is, which had been standard, and is standard really today. And they said you have to either go to Abhaz schools, which there are very few of, or basically, it was interpreted on the ground as um, making the Georgian language mandatory. So you can imagine, overnight, one year, in basically one school year, um, the, the Abhas were told, you have to now do all schooling in all levels in the Georgian language, a language which virtually nobody knew among the ethnic Abhas and other ethnic groups, the Russians, the Greeks, others uh, within Abhasia. Russian had always been the lingua franca of Abhasia, which is another interesting story that I'll get to when I get back to the 1930s. Um, but this is the thing, especially in the 1940s and the 1950s, that the Abhas were really angry about, that this was really a blow to their prestige, to their self-identity. Uh, teachers were forced to, all the teachers had to leave their jobs, basically, because they couldn't teach in Georgian. Um, they even, people fled to Krasnodar and elsewhere in Russia, just because they, they wanted education for their children, or the teachers wanted to have work. And, and you see that resonating for decades beyond. It may be actually forgotten today in Abhasia and not so uh, in, important among people's memories. But in the 40s up until the 1960s, that was really the basis of the complaints. This is the things that the Georgians had done to us that was so egregious and so intolerable. So all those are the things that happened under, 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 in the late Stalin period under Mughaladze. If you go back before that, though, then you actually have the period of, of Beria's ascension, uh, which was really from 1937 up until 1943 and during the war. Um, and Beria, of course, uh, was an important party player in the, uh, in the Caucasus. He had made his career in the Caucasus, first in the secret police. He had then expanded his, his network uh, to take over control of the Transcaucasian secret police. And then he had become party chief in, in Georgia. And then he had become party chief all over the Transcaucasus. And he had demonstrated his efficiencies, efficient, efficiencies yes, but his, uh, his effectiveness uh, to Stalin such that in October 1938 he was then promoted to Moscow to become the head of the, of the NKVD, the secret police. Um, in Abhazia, Beria destroyed the existing patronage network that had been there before, the Abhaz, ethnically Abhaz patronage network. Um, and when Beria came into Abhazia, it was really coincided with the Great Purges, 1936 and 1938. Uh, and under using the mechanisms of the Purges, the party leadership there uh, which had been primarily ethnically Abhazian, although not completely, uh, was really, really decimated, even down to the, the children and wives and spouses and relatives of, of, those, uh, of those previous party leaders. Uh, it was under Beria that um, the, uh, the resettlement began. They, under Beria, they created the Spetspedesilin Stroy, which was responsible for this resettlement of basically Mingrelian peasants to to these new collective farms. But like I said, it was in very small numbers under Beria. It was created in 1939, and it didn't really take off until, uh, until after Mughaladze's time in 1943 and into the late 40s and 50s. Um, nevertheless, the fact that Beria's patronage network was primarily Georgian, but it's also interesting that it wasn't exclusively Georgian. And George, Beria had some very key players within his own network in Abhazia who were not Georgian, who were ethnic Abhaz. Mikhail Delba, for example, was uh, an intellectual who assisted him in his um, 
previous head of the of uh, the Inkabata in in Apazia, Agrippa, was also an Apaz, although he ended up being executed. Um, so it wasn't exclusively Georgian. Uh, yet, because it was there were so many Georgians in it, uh, it then later became perceived in Apazia as what they did to us, as what Tiflis did, what Beria did, Beria representing all of the Georgians, um, which is, again, I think, an, an unfortunate result of, of this reification of, of, of ethnogenesis, of national identity, but also the way that ethnicity tied into these patronage networks as well. Ethnicity was a, a means of trust, right? You, you form informal networks on the basis of who you trust. You tend to trust those people who are around you, who share characteristics with you. It's not an exclusive thing. Like I said, Beria in Apazia had Apaz members of his patronage network. Elsewhere, he had um, other members of other ethnicities within his patronage network, both in the Caucasus and in Georgia and elsewhere. He was a master of manipulating patronage relationships, of encouraging loyalty, of, of, of assuring loyalty of his patrons. But it, nevertheless, because it had, because it was uh, so dominantly, because his patronage network was so dominantly Georgian, it is perceived and was perceived, and to this day is perceived, as something, as an ethnic thing of what the Georgians did to us. But if you push back even further before that, what was the patronage network that Beria destroyed when he came in in 1937? And that, I think, is one of the most interesting aspects of, of the history of Abhazia, uh, which is the patronage network that existed in Abhazia in the 1920s and the 1930s. Uh, and that is um, the one based around Nestor Lakoba. And Nestor Lakoba today is sort of like uh, I don't know, for the Americans present, he's sort of like the George Washington of, more, of modern Apazia. He's the national figure, the central, the main street in Tsukumi is, is uh, to this day, is called Lakoba Street. Um, the main school, school number 10, is named for Lakoba. Um, Lakoba was a very interesting guy. He was an ethnic Apaz. He was a, came from a peasant background in the region of Gudauta, which in Apazia is sort of the most ethnically Apaz region of, uh, of Apazia. Um, he was almost completely deaf. And we know that we actually have, at the Stanford Institute, they have his medical reports. And he was famous for having this listening, electronic listening devices, what do you call that? A horn. Oh, not, not just a horn, actually, but a primitive uh, electric hearing. ear, hearing aid, yeah. Um, and there's this sort of a famous picture um, that's been included in some of the books about Stalin that shows Stalin at a doctor sitting uh, and there's a, somebody at a table who's misidentified in many books as a radio operator. In fact, it's not a radio operator. It's, it's, it's Lakoba with his hearing aid. Um, and Lakoba is interesting for a number of reasons. Uh, one of those is that he was also an able manipulator of, of patronage and a user of patronage. Uh, he was also a very close associate of, of Stalin and on very good terms with Stalin. And this continues this sort of theme of the fact of having this ability to interact, having access, having face time to the, to the top leaders, made you, uh, gave you resources, it was, was tangible. And Lakoba was certainly able to make use of that. He had actually known Stalin since before the revolution. Um, according to the Abhas historian Stanislav Lakoba, who's sort of a dodgy fellow, and I'm not sure how much you believe him, but uh, Lakoba was the only person who Stalin allowed to beat him at billiards, and one of the only people who was allowed to call him Koba to his face, especially in later years. That Stalin said to him, Ti Lakoba, Yakoba Ti Lakoba. Um, and Lakoba had created this network, which is really sort of the epitome of um, the locally based patronage network. What in, in uh, Soviet, Soviet uh, nomenclatura slang uh, was called the gnizdo, a nest. Because there are two types of, of patronage networks in the Soviet period. There was a gnizdo, which was a locally based network. And then there was a khost, a khost, a tail which is a, a vertical patronage network. And um, you can see how um, Beria, for example, was able to tie the two together of using a local patronage network within regions uh, and then tie that to a, a vertical patronage network. And many people did this too. Lakoba did this particularly with his ties to Stalin, but more specifically with his ties to Orjana Kidze. He was very close friends with Orjana Kidze going back at least to the early 1920s. There are a number of letters in the Stanford collection from uh, going back and forth between uh, Sergo Orjanakidze and Lakoba. Uh, so Lakoba also was somebody who created a patronage network based largely around ethnicity, but not exclusively. 
Um, most of the people who were in his network were, were members of his extended family, were people from Gudauta, uh, were people from, uh, from an Abha's background, but not exclusively. There were a number of important Georgian players, for example, within uh, his own patronage network. And they, he relied, and the Abha's leadership in the 20s and 30s relied to a great deal on, on Russians, on Russian bureaucrats, particularly on a, a number of people who in the Soviet parlances would consider, be considered very dodgy people, uh, sort of ex-whites, um, and, and people who had fled from Crimea after the Civil War and sort of ended up in Abhazia. And because they were literate, because they, they had skills, experiences as bureaucrats, they were sort of recruited uh, into, the, into La Copa's network and into the administrative bureaucracy in the 1920s and the 1930s. Uh, and that explains one of the more interesting aspects of, of Abhazia at that time, which is uh, the relationship to, to official languages. And I basically wrote a whole paper about this because it's something really interesting. In the 1930s, 1920s and the 1930s, you had this general policy which uh, was more generally referred to as karinizatsia. More usually it was actually called nationalizatsia, or sort of, of indigenization, of giving, uh, of supporting local languages, of supporting local culture too. And that's where you get, by the end of the Soviet period, um, this sort of shift that I talked about before from uh, the political to the, the cultural, the cultural becoming political. It begins in that period. But you had the encouragement of local languages in all of these little republics. In Abhazi, you had that as well. You had um, all of these decrees about the encouragement of, of Abhaz language, of publishing an Abhaz language, of creating institutes of Abhaz language. Um, and you had decree after decree saying that uh, paperwork, this is one of my favorite Russian words, Dilaprazvodstva, had to be transferred into Abhaz. And you had, I actually counted all these decrees that were made beginning in the early 1920s. And you had one in 1922, one in 1923, one in 1925, one in 1927, one in 1931, one in 1932, one in 1934, one in 1937, and after that they didn't really care so much. But in each of these decrees it says, we have to, we have to put paperwork into the Abhaz language. We're ordering typewriters and it's going to happen within six months, the next decree. We really have to get our Dela Prozvoz into Abhazia. We need to get some typewriters uh, and we think we can do this six months to a year. The next one, again and again and again. It never happens though, which is the really interesting aspect. They never are able to make Abhaz into a workable language uh, for Dela Prazvodstva. And there, I think there are a number of reasons for this. One is, of course, the fact that Russian had been the lingua franca and the language of administration in Abhazia going back uh, at least until the Tsarist conquest uh, or the, the, the Caucasian Wars in the 1860s and the 1870s. So in living memory, it had always been the administrative, the government language. Um, Another reason, I think, is just the fact of these relying on these ethnic Russians for the administrative class. There was an article, a famous article, one of the only ones in the West published about Abhazia that was written uh, in the 1980s by Daryl Slider about um, looking at the party numbers from the 1920s and the 1930s, actually goes up to the 40s, and trying, there, he looks at that and sees that there's a decrease in Georgians, I think in, between 1928 and 1932. So his point of this article is how is that this is a sign that the Georgians were repressing the Abbas because there was a decrease in Abbas. Actually, if you look at it more closely, it's not about Georgians increasing at all. It has nothing to do with the Georgians. What increases is the Russians because those are the number of people who are brought into the party. Those are the number of people who are giving these responsible positions. And they were answering to Lakova. Lakova was making use of those um, because the more Russians you had, the less you had to worry about Georgians, the less Georgians you had uh, clamoring for positions. Um, and also I think that explains the language as well. It was the balancing language. It was sort of a similar situation to what you have in, in, in colonial Africa, where you had uh, the local, um, local elites giving preference to either English or French, these imperial languages, over their own languages or other local ethnic languages, because it maintained this balance. And that's what you had in Abhazia. So e emphasis was always given to Russian. They always wanted to use Russian as the administrative language. Um, because everybody spoke it, um, and because encouraging local languages uh, was dangerous, because you could, you could uh, give resources to Abhas, but that was never going to become a formal language, and they knew that. Increas in encouraging local languages for them meant encouraging Georgian, and that was dangerous, because they didn't speak Georgian, and because the Georgians did. And they could see what was happening outside of Abhazia in the rest of the Georgian Republic, that having uh, that Georgian language ability was a criteria for for advancement and promotion and things like that. With Abhazia, they could prevent that from happening by supporting exactly the imperial language, by supporting Russian. So it was this patronage network that Beria destroyed, or, or were destroyed under the purges in 1937. Um, you also can see how um, really exceptional the 
um, the Yapa's patronage network was in the 1920s and the 1930s under La Coba. First of all, because it was in this time that you had the beginning of this relationship, um, this triadic relationship, where the local elites could bypass Tbilisi or Tiflis at the time and appeal directly to Moscow, either going through these, these elites uh, or appealing, going there in person, uh, which is, again, which is an exception, right? It didn't happen. You didn't have member uh, elites from local autonomous republics in the North Caucasus, say, that had a direct line to Moscow and could sort of triangulate and make their press two sides against, or rather press two centers against each other. So that was something very exceptional. What was also very exceptional is the way that Lakoba actually administered things within Abkhazia during this period in the 20s and 30s. Uh, he was able really to maintain a status quo. He was a Bolshevik. He had this long history as an underground communist Bolshevik leader. When he came to power, though, he really wanted to maintain things as they were, um, within reason. So uh, Abkhazia didn't become, in the 1920s, you had no uh, red terror like you had elsewhere in Russia. You had no, uh, the, the aristocrats were sort of supported by, by Beria. Um, he actually is accused at some points of giving them pensions um, and giving them money. Um, he maintained traditional practices and he maintained the position of the peasantry. And even when the position of, of Moscow, the center, became one of repressing the peasantry with the, the coming of collectivization in the early 1930s, uh, Lakoba was able to smooth that out. First of all, he was able to appeal to Stalin and say, well, we really, we don't have any of these kulaks here. Um, we, we don't, we don't need to start dekulakization because they, they weren't here to begin with. We have a different sort of more feudal, more, more traditional relationship. Uh, and he was able, uh, in 1931, to uh, make sure that collectivization was um, put off. In 1931, the center really started to press this in Abkhazia, starting from the spring of 1931. Um, the party um, began sending instructors in. They were coming from Tiflis and from Moscow and saying, what? How come, you, how come you didn't start last year when everybody else did? Uh, and pressing it. Uh, and the, the peasants in, Guda, in Beria's own constituency, in Gudaute, in his home base, uh, had an uprising in, 19, in 1931, in February of 1931. And I wrote a whole, other, a whole paper about this particular incident, this uh, collectivization uprising that took place. And Lakoba was really able to, uh, to mediate which is something very exceptional, I think, in the Soviet system. Well, this didn't happen in Ukraine. This didn't happen in elsewhere in, in, in uh, areas which were even, even to a lesser degree collectivized. That Lakoba was able to nullify the, pe mollify the peasants, to promise, make them promises, but also to use his connections and use his authority to make sure that um, the, the requirements were restricted, that really collectivization didn't get implemented in Abkhazia until after Lakoba's death, after 1936, after uh, uh, when Beria came in, and again, as I talked about, really reaching its peak in the 1940s. So that's something that's really interesting and really, really exceptional. Um, the, the fact that this took place at the same time that discussions about status were happening is one that's also quite interesting. Um, as I said, these, these demonstrations, uh, this was called a, a, a schod in the documents, um, a gathering, but actually a peasant uprising. Um, they took place in, in February of 1931, which at the same time that the status of Abkhazia was being changed. Um, up until that time, Abkhazia had sort of this weird status of being a Dagavurna uh, Respublika, it was called, a, 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 a agreement republic that entered the Transcaucasian Republic through Georgia on the basis of a union treaty, which was, a, it was an unusual status, but it was finally sort of uh, ended in 19, February 1931, where that status was switched to a, an autonomous republic, uh, which it remained for the rest of the Soviet period. Uh, in Abkhaz historiography, those two events, this peasant uprising against collectivization and that status change, are linked as one. And for Abkhaz, historians have argued that what Lakoba did, the agreement he made with Moscow and with Stalin in particular, was to say, put off collectivization and we, we will allow this change of status. And that was part, that was one of the, the grievances of Abhaz against Georgians and Stalin being Georgian, this is what they've done to us. It's also part of these histories of the 1960s and 1970s and 80s, particularly Stanislav Lakoba. Um, as far as I can see from the documents, and this is one area where the uh, tales from the archive really is, is sort of central, there is a massive folder about this event, about 300 pages of documents from that particular uh, peasant uprising. And there's... Um, 
what they call uh, SWOTKI, KGB reports or secret police reports, about even about who was there, about what things they were saying, about who said what. Uh, like I said, 300 pages of, of verbatim text, well, to the extent that anything could be reported at that time is verbatim, but uh, what, what was being reported. Uh, and there, nobody mentions it at all. Nobody mentions status. The question is, there's not a single word in all of those 300 documents about tying these two things together. There's also no mention of that in the press. It wasn't something that people were talking about. It's not something that was in the newspapers. It's not something that there, there are public traces, there are traces remaining in the historical record. Um, it may be, there may be some connection, but there's no documentary evidence of that. If there was, however, some relationship, then it means, I think, that the Abhazian case is all the more interesting because it shows, or it would show in that case, that local elites were able to use or manipulate um, ethnic feeling uh, and ethnic sentiment for political goals. And this is something that became uh, evident in the later period, in the 1980s, for example, under Paris Strike, local elites, particularly ethnic elites, were able to mobilize national sentiment in order to get resources, or in order to get something from, from the center, from Moscow. Um, if this is true, then this was happening in Abhazia even in 1931, all the way back then. Although, again, there's, there's no documentary evidence. There's, not, there's no smoking gun, there's no documents which can relate those two things together. So that then takes us back to the earliest period about which I'm going to speak, and that is the actual creation of the Soviet Union, where this problem of status and of ethnic identity and the relationship between the ethnic groups sort of got their start. And that's the, the revolutionary period, say from 1918 to 1922 when things were solidified. <clears throat> Another reason that Abhazi is very interesting is that uh, in 1918, after the Russian Revolution, uh, there was an attempt to create Bolshevik Abhazia that lasted for 42 days in uh, April and May of 1918. And they actually created what they called the Sukhumskaya Kamuni, like in Baku, the, the, the Baku Kamu, um, which is sort of this famous event in, in the history of the Russian Revolution, but really a, a famous outlier because it was so different from what was going on elsewhere. You had a local Bolshevik leadership in Baku who took power, uh, who lasted for a short time, longer than Abhazia, but only for several months, but who implemented uh, Sovietization in a very different way from what happened in, in central Russia and, and elsewhere. There, were no, there was no terror, there were no mass executions. Um, they were led by local eth ethnic representatives of ethnic minorities. They were sensitive to uh, minority issues and that sort of thing. Uh, and the same thing is, is more or less true in Abhazia as well, in, in this so-called Baku commune, this first attempt to institutionalize uh, Soviet, to, to create Soviet power in Abhazia. Um, there, was a, there was no terror, it was, there was a fight. So it was different in that sense. They didn't come to power by electoral means. Um, they did actually violently tr attempt to seize power. Uh, there are very interesting documents that are in the Georgian archives from the, uh, from the archives of the Georgian government. This is the period of the Georgian Democratic Republic, right? 1918, uh, actually just before it, which is critical. Uh, but there are, are um, the documents in the Georgian archives about the Georgian governments are police documents, as if this was uh, a crime committed by bandits, which in a sense it was, which is sort of interesting. So you have the, the reports of the Georgian government are police reports about the, the Bolshevik attempt to seize power in Sukhumi during this period. Um, that particular uprising was led in two directions by two important people. First of all, Lakoba, uh, who uh, had behind him a peasant uprising. And to do that, he mobilized a traditional concept in Abha's culture, uh, particularly in Abhaz uh, peasant culture, which was all called Kiraz, which in Abhaz, Abhaz means like um, mutual support. Krugovaya Paruka. And they used it not only for military means, but also in, in sort of crops and farming. If, if one peasant village uh, didn't have enough food, they would sort of assist each other and they would help each other plow their crops. But also in times of trouble, in times of threat, they would create Kiraz or mutual assistance as, as a guerrilla as a insurgency means, or to fight. And this had been done uh, against the Russians in the mid-19th century, and it had been done previously in history. So the Lakoba, under Lakoba, the Bolsheviks made use of that. They um, used this kiraz and the, the traditional instruments of that, particularly the swearing of an oath. Um, and so uh, Lakoba, coming from Gudayota, was able to mobilize this. And he had held these peasant meetings, and he oversaw the oath-taking to kiraz, and they provided some of the muscle behind 
this attempt to seize power in, in 1918. It's also interesting then that those same people are the ones who were behind that peasant uprising in 1931. The exact same people, the exact same peasants. And bringing up these exact same things. And they said in 1931, back in 1918, we took the oath together with Lakoba. We made a deal with you. And now you're breaking that deal. So you sort of see this social contract as well, from their point of view, of this relationship of, of, of Lakoba, which meant, made him very different from other Soviet bosses. But anyway, in 1918, Lakoba and Kiraz were one element of this uprising, this Sukhumi commune. The other one was another interesting character in Georgian history, which is a guy named Eshba. His picture has floated up a few times. Um, Yefrem Eshba, who was a very unusual Abhaz guy. And unusual because he was, first of all, he was a, from a noble family which in his later biography he tried to gloss over. He said his father was poor, his father died, and he got sent away. In fact, his, his father perhaps was poor, but Eshba was sent on state scholarships. He went to gymnasia, first in Sukhumi, then sent to Kutaisi, then to Tiflis. And ultimately, he was sent on a state scholarship to Moscow University. So he must have been a, really, a pretty bright guy to, to be able to do all these things. This was unusual. This wasn't what normally happened to members of ethnic minorities in far-off peripheral parts of the empire. Um, he became, when he went to Moscow, he met Marxist revolutionaries, some of them who became very important Marxist revolutionaries, uh, and he himself became a Marxist. Uh, it seems he never actually finished um, Moscow University, but got caught up in these underground Bolshevik activities, uh, and then the war came. Uh, but Eshba is this intellectual, he's also the, the ideologue among the Alpas. Lakoba was always very pra pragmatic and practical. Eshba was the ideas guy. And Eshba was really the, the ideal leader behind this Sukhumi Kami, the one who, had, who was uh, coordinating the delivery of weapons, who was coordinating the different groups. And when this Sukhumi commune took place, he was the head of the, he was the Pritzidata of the Revkoma, the Revolutionary Committee, that was sort of the provisional government set up by the insurgency. Um, this commune failed in May 1918. They were chased out of Batumi. They then fled to, to Budauta. They were chased out of there and went to Gagra. And a month later, they were chased out of Gagra and finally went up into Russia. Both Eshpa and Lakoba sort of were involved in the civil war. The reason for this failure, I think, has more to do with the, the patterns of the civil war that were taking place at the time, the fact that the Abkhazia and the South Caucasus were cut off from Moscow, a bit by the White Army in between, uh, also by what was happening geopolitically here. Um, from May 1918, you had the, the formation of the Georgian Democratic Republic, the consolidation of that, and one of the first acts that they did was uh, of the Geor actually Georgian army after May, 19 May 26, 1918, was, was to chase these Abhaz, or rather these Bolsheviks, out of, of Gudauta. Um, it's also interesting, though, that it was not ethnic, this Sukhumskaya Kamuna. It was made up of people of different eth ethnicities. Um, there were a number of Georgian Bolsheviks who were involved with this, and, and they were actually criticized after it failed for not taking into account the national principle that you should have declared this uh, Bolshevik Sukhumi as an ethnic entity, but you didn't do that. And that's one of the reasons that in later Soviet historiography uh, given for the failure of this, of this experiment, of this attempt. By 1921, things changed. As you all know the history of the Bolshevik conquest of Georgia. Um, in, by the end of February, the beginning of March, um, Abkhazia was finally Sovietized. Uh, you had the 9th Red Army coming down from Kuban, which was then going to meet the 11th Army coming up through Borcello from, uh, from Azerbaijan. Uh, what's interesting, though, is those Abkhaz leaders, Lakoba and Eshba, they had been very busy. La Eshba himself had met with Lenin. He had been sent to the North Caucasus. Apparently, both Lakoba and Eshba had been sent to Turkey to negotiate with, um, with Ataturk. It's thought that um, this was because they had close connections among the Abkhaz diaspora in Turkey. I, there are no documents on, from the Turkish side yet. Apparently, one uh, Russian historian has found documents in, in the, the Moscow archives about this assignment uh, of, uh, of the Abkhaz to go there, uh, to go to Turkey. In any case, they were there. They were in Turkey um, in 1921 when the, the Red Army came. And the, finally, the final um, Sovietization of Abkhazia happened without them. And there was a local Revkom, or a temporary Revkom, that was headed by Russians and Georgians. Karagatskaya and uh, Izak Zhvania would become a later important Georgian Bolshevik. Um, when Soviet power was installed on March, March 4th, um, they weren't here. And they were recalled. They were sent by a special radio telegram was sent to Turkey to bring Eshba and Lakoba back to Suhumi. And on March 6th, they came. 
and they formed a new Revcom, a new revolutionary committee, with them as the head of it. Uh, and they sent, that's when they sent a congratulatory telegram to, uh, to, to Lenin, declaring that Soviet Abkhazia is red, that Soviet Abkhazia is, that Abkhazia is now, now Soviet. Um, those two guys then immediately set about creating Soviet institutions, of creating Soviet Abkhazia, and I've just finished a new paper which is about this. Um, and which, the most important, the most interesting thing I think here is how you have this creation of those things which would become so important later. This institutionalization of, of nationality policy and also tied in with the question of status, but also the beginnings of this local patronage network. And here you see this clear division. Um, Eshba became the guy who was thinking about status, status and about ethnicity and about definition of Abhazia and what, how Abhazia is going to fit into this new Soviet structure that's going to be created. Lakoba was not really interested in that sort of thing, but he immediately starts to bring in his people and start to create his networks. And there are reports uh, in the Georgian archives um, complaining about what's going on in Abhazia and complaining about Lakoba and saying, this is a violation of Soviet principles. He's putting his relatives in charge of everything. He's bringing his own people in, regardless of whether they're good at the job or not. This is going to undermine Soviet, uh, Soviet power. But that's what he was doing. Um, Eshba then was the one who was sent to Tbilisi to, Tbilisi to negotiate um, the question of status. One of the interpretations of later Georgian historiography um, is that this idea of Abhaz status was something that was sort of placed as a, a long-acting mine, as a slow detonation mine that would later blow things up and make things difficult in the future. Um, it seems to me that that explanation is a little too, uh, little too easy, and it really doesn't reflect actually how this process happened. What, seems interesting about how the status question came about is that it seems that the only people pushing it were these local leaders, and particularly Eshba. Lakoba didn't even like the idea. And Eshba, um, there's some interesting documents that were later published uh, in Sukhumi, these. In 1997, the, pub the private papers of Lakoba, of Eshba, sorry, were published. Uh, and only in 2010, um, a number of documents that were collected by the Arzimba Fund were published. And in these documents, they're quite remarkable, actually, because it shows that uh, Eshba uh, had to convince Lakoba and the other ethnic Abhaz leaders um, that, this was, that they should do this, that they should press for some sort of status. Uh, and they were reluctant about it. They didn't care about it, actually. I think that's ultimately is the answer to the question of status from the point of view of the Abhaz leadership and, say, from the point of view of, of, of Lakoba's patronage network, that for him it was sort of irrelevant. Soviet power was here to stay. There wasn't a question of it disappearing someday. And what was really important was using nationality policy and ethnic identity to get resources and to divide those up and to make use of them. For Eshba, it was more about this principle, this idea of having recognition, having some formal status. And Eshba actually pressed Orjana Kidze directly about this status issue and said, we are demanding uh, as a return, as a result, as a, uh, a reward for the Soviet role, rather the, Bolshe the Abhaz role in supporting the Bolsheviks in creating Soviet of Abhazia in this insurgency. Um, that we, first of all, we need it as a reward for what we've done. Second of all, we're a minority in this republic. We need the support of our own ethnicity. And in order to bolster that support, we need to show them something. And what we can show them is this issue of status. And for Eshba, it becomes really, you can see from, him, from, his, from his personal writings, that for him, it's, it's his greatest personal accomplishment, getting this status. And what the status that Abhazia got, as you probably know, uh, after March 1921, was very unusual. It was the status of a Soviet, Soviet republic. Of course, to this day, they say that you know, we had this status. We were a complete republic back then, and we've lost that now. Of course, it didn't mean so much at the time, because there was no republic. There was no USSR, right, until, uh, until the very beginning of 1923. It didn't exist. So the status of everybody was a little strange. Um, and this is at the time when the, the central leadership wasn't even encouraging formal status at this level. They were trying to join things together. They were trying to join Abhazia, or sorry, uh, Georgia, Azerbaijan, and Armenia into one overall federation. So this idea of giving some independent status to this tiny little chunk uh, on the coast of Georgia wasn't, wasn't what they wanted to do. Stalin didn't want to do it, or, or Janakidze didn't want to do it. But Eshba was able to press them so that he got this agreement. And he was able to make this argument to say, look, we need to show to our constituency, to the ethnic Abhaz particularly, and to everybody else in Abhazia, that we can get what the previous government could. And Eshba talks about this, about uh, when the meeting took place um, with Orjana Kidze, uh, it took place in Batumi in March of 1921. 
he came out of that meeting and he had the paper in his hand, this declaration that Abhazi was going to be a Soviet Socialist Republic. And he saw a, a prince, Shavashidze, and he, he said, this is a state secret, but I want to see the look on this prince's face when he sees we got autonomy. Despite all of the things that, you know, all of these negotiations that had been going on under the, under the Georgian government about all of this repression of the Tsarist period, look, one year of Bolshevik power, less than that, months of Bolshevik power, and we have this status. And he said, God help me, but I violated this rule. I violated my Bolshevik oath, and I took the document out, and I showed it to him. And you had to see the look on his face when he saw this. Um, that status, of course, was very quickly reversed or mitigated um, within a year. Uh, by 1922, then you have this creation of this the uh, Gavornaya Respublika, this creation of this union, union treaty. What also becomes really interesting about that is that Eshba himself um, goes to Tiflis and he becomes part of the Georgian lobby. If you remember, this period in Georgian history is also has a critical role in overall Soviet history because this is the so-called Georgian question, right, in 1921 to 1923, uh, which has to do with what status the Soviet Union is going to take. What are we going to build out of this? What kind of structure is the Soviet Union going to be? And the Georgians, especially the, the main character was, was Midivani, Bubu Midivani, uh, but also Filip Makharadze joined them as well, and all of the local Georgian Bolshevik leaders who had just come into Georgia at the, at the front of the 11th Red Army, who had just destroyed Georgian sovereignty and Georgian independence, all of a sudden they became Georgian nationalists, or Georgian Bolshevik nationalists, right? They became, started to agitate against these plans of the center, and of, of Stalin and Roger Nikidze particularly, of, um, of creating a centralized state uh, in order to give some autonomy or, or structure to, or, or authority, local authority, to places like, like Georgia. Eshba went to Tiflis and joined those guys. Roger Nikidze, snarling, snarlingly, yelled at, at, at Eshba that you're a Georgian patriot. <laughs> but it was, it's sort of ironic that the, this, the person who was most pushing for uh, this independent formal status for Abhazia joined with the Georgian nationalists, essentially, the Georgian Bolshevik nationalists. Uh, and he was actually then started to move up within the Georgian hierarchy. He, was, uh, he became a member of the Georgian Central Committee and of the, even the Georgian uh, Politburo. Uh, and he was a, a made Minister of Justice in October uh, of, of 1922. In, on October 22nd, 1922, the Georgian Central Committee resigned in mass. It's one of the very strange things in Soviet history. It's almost unprecedented. I think it is unprecedented that the entire Central Committee uh, of a Union Republic resigned because of this Georgian question, because of this issue of status, because um, essentially Stalin was forcing them to give up autonomy and to join this Transcaucasian Federation. Espo was one of those. Espo was a member of the Georgian government who resigned in protest against that. Um, what is also sort of interesting that in modern Abhazia, those two guys, Espa and Lakoba, are the two main heroes. In addition to Lakoba Street, there's also an Espa Street. There's statues to Espa all over the place. What comes out from the documents is that they actually didn't like each other. Um, and Espa essentially had to leave Abhazia after this whole thing happened because Lakova wouldn't support him and because they couldn't see eye to eye on these things. Um, and again, because of, the, of this difference over this issue of status. For Lakova, it just didn't matter. Lakova was interested in, in patronage politics. Lakova then tied himself to Urjana Kidze, who was the enemy of these uh, Georgian nationalists. And made, that's really the reason his star continued to rise and his association then uh, sort of tied to, to Stalin about that through the Urjana Kidze network throughout the 1920s. Eshpa himself had to leave Abhazia because he couldn't live together with, with Lakoba. There was no room for the, both, for the two of them uh, within Abhazia. And after the debacle in Tbilisi, after the resignation of the Central Committee, uh, together with Medivani and a lot of the other, these other Georgian nationalists, he was, he was sent to study. So he was sent to the, the courses of the Red Professor in Moscow in 1924. He then had a really interesting career, which is in the documents of the Art Zinbuk collection. He was uh, sent to England as, uh, as a representative of the Soviet Foreign Trade Ministry. Um, he then came back to the Soviet Union. He was a, a party figure in, in Chechnya for a while, and then he joined Trotsky, and he became uh, one of the, the Trotsky opposition in, at the 15th Party Congress in 1927, where he was physically attacked by Stalinists during the, 20, during the 15th Party Congress. Uh, and he was removed from the party after, after Trotsky was defeated. Uh, he was then sent to America um, as 
part of AMTOR, the Soviet Trading Organization. And there's a lot of documents here from America, which coming from New York is sort of strange. There's documents here about the registration of AMTOR in New York State, which for me is like two worlds colliding to see these guys all of a sudden in my own state. Uh, documents from Albany and, and, and things like that. He also apparently crashed a car outside of Houston. And there's all sorts of documents about calling his Ford dealership and trying to get his insurance and <laughs> things like this. Um, Eshba and Lakoba ultimately ended up meeting sort of similar fates. Well, actually, they both ended up dying more or less at the same time. Eshba was arrested in 1936. Um, he was um, apparently um, deported to uh, Kalima in, in 1939, where he was, where he presumably was executed. I think there's no, no record of him being executed, but he, he died in the purchase. Um, Lakoba had a stranger ending, but ultimately became the same thing. Uh, Lakoba's death is still rather mysterious. Lakoba was invited uh, in December of 1936 to have dinner at Beria's house before attending an opera of Palyashvili in, in the opera theater. Um, he was staying in the, the Majestic Hotel, which is now the, the, the Tbilisi Marriott. Um, after having dinner at Beria's house, he became ill, um, and he was taken from the theater back to the hotel where he died during the night. Um, how this, <laughs> what actually happened, nobody knows. Um, it's the body later disappeared. Um, there was never an autopsy conducted. Um, the, certainly, from the Apa's point of view, um, this is another of the things that the Georgians did to us. This is something that Beria did on behalf of the Georgians or on behalf of Stalin, murdered uh, Lakoba. Um, political enemies of Beria had a had a habit of of dying mysteriously. The party chief in uh, Armenia mysteriously fell out of a window during a meeting in 19 <laughs> with with Beria. So it's, it's, it's not out of the question that he was poisoned. But in any case, he died in 19, December of 1936. But he died uh, and was buried with honors. And in fact, Berius uh, sent his uh, wreath to uh, Lakoba, or to the funeral of Lakoba. Immediately after that, though, uh, Beria, Lakoba was then declared enemy of the people. And then all of his network was, was rolled up. And that's where you had this um, the purging. Berius people coming in, conducting show trials. The things that they used against Beria, were, or rather against Lakoba, were all these things that he'd been doing in the 1920s and 1930s. All of these, these uh, efforts to maintain the status quo were then used as uh, examples of how he was counter-revolutionary, and about all of his members of his patronage network were, were counter-revolutionary. So you can see that ultimately, um, all of these things lead up to a very complex history that sort of defies easy explanations or easy um, categorizations of things. But you can sort of see the, the ways in which um, these historical events, because in part because of Soviet nationality policy, because of the way in which ethnicity was infused with politics and symbols of, of, of ethnicity and culture were, were became politicized, that these things ultimately would become grievances that became ethnically based, that became, um, if not causes of conflict, certainly um, that became um, sort of dry tinder, dry firewood that could ultimately become combustible when the situation would change and when things would emerge and we, would become the basis of, of complaints. And you can see over this historiography about how these things were, were retold and uh, were reimagined and uh, how the uh, later, contempor later uh, concerns were then projected back on these things. For example, like the way in which the 1931 uprising in later generations was, was seen as sort of the first of, 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 a of wave of political demonstrations against oppression from the outside. Um, one final word about the sources of all these things. Um, one of the other reasons why Abkhazia is interesting, first of all, is that the documents within Abkhazia itself are, are not there. Uh, maybe you've seen some of the pictures flashing by of this pile of ashes. And that's what remains of the, of the Abkhaz state archives. Uh, during the war, uh, during the period that the Georgians controlled Sukhumi in, in uh, June of 1992, the archives burned. Um, of course, documents like, uh, like manuscripts, uh, and uh, there are a number of documents that survived, and I've seen a number of those documents. Uh, but the fire was, was pretty extensive. We, they also burned the Abhaz National Library. Um, so, documents from Abhazia itself are hard to come by, but you, ask, you have a lot of so other sources, particularly in the Georgian archives. Um, many things were done in triplicate. Right? They would do one copy for Tiflis, one copy for Moscow, and one copy stayed there. Um, there actually there are initiatives on the Georgian side of scanning these documents. I don't know if they've actually started it, but they've been talking about it. Of, of sending these to Abkhazia, sort of restoring some of that lost history. So all of this this destruction of an archive is almost 
um, sort of Foucault, the, Foucault, Michel Foucault put into life, right, the destruction of archives, the destruction of memory, the destruction of history. Um, but you have this beginning of at least the, the idea to, to restore it, to send it back. Um, but you also have some other really interesting sources, and a lot of these things were the ones that were, that were published. And as I said, you have the personal pa papers of, of, of Eshba uh, and the ones that were gathered later, some of them were brought back from Moscow. Um, you have one volume that was published in 1992, early in 1992, it's called Documenti Svidetelstvo, and there's a, I put a picture of it, that's on one of these things flashing by. There are some people that argue that, particularly the Abhas, who argue that uh, the reason the archive burned, or that they burned the archive, was exactly the publication of this volume, that this volume contained several hundred documents, most of which were about the uh, deportations uh, or, or the resettlements, the deportations of Abhazi and the resettlements of, of Georgians into Abhazi that took place in the, in the 1930s and the 1940s, and that in revenge for that being published, the Georgians then burned the archive. Whether that's true or not, I don't know, but it's a, really, it's a very important source, and it, like I said, it has several hundred documents relating to the 1930s and 1940s. Uh, there's also a volume of um, documents from the Abhaz KGB archive, which were published in the early 2000s. Actually, I think they first appeared in the, the mid-1990s. Uh, but these are really interesting documents because they're uh, police reports and uh, informer report, informant reports uh, from the from the Georgian from the Abhas KGB archive. Obviously, any collection like this is inherently limited um, and inherently biased, but it is nevertheless contains a number of interesting documents. Uh, and lastly, one of the most important, the most interesting source is the one that's not in Georgia at all, and that's the personal papers of of, of Nestor Lakoba. Um, when Lakoba was uh, after he died. His wife, Saria, collected his documents in a metal box. Uh, and when Lakoba was declared an enemy of the people, she buried the box. She and her brother, her younger brother, buried this box. Uh, Saria herself was, was arrested and tortured and, and died in the purges. Um, after destalinization, uh, in the mid 1950s, the younger brother came back to find the box. And the, the apartment where it was buried had been turned into a, 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 a barracks or a dormitory. Uh, and uh, he couldn't, he dug up the floorboards and the box was gone. So he asked the local party officials, did you see a box? And they said, yeah, there's the box, and they gave it to him. Mm -hmm. And the box found its way out of the Soviet Union uh, and ended up in California, where it's uh, in this, the Hoover collection, the, the Hoover Institution Archive collection. Uh, and the, it, now it consists of three separate boxes. Uh, the first box is made up of pictures, of which some of the pictures that you see here of, of Stalin and Beria on vacation uh, which have been published in a number of different books lately about, about Stalin in particular, uh, come from that first box. The second two boxes are um, correspondence and drafts by Lakoba. Um, and um, there's personal letters, communications with Rajana Kidze, there's letters about Trotsky, which is really interesting, which is another aspect of uh, sort of where you see larger history touching a small place. In 1924, uh, when, when uh, Stalin, when Lenin died, there was the question of secession. And one of, the key one of the key candidates for that was Trotsky. Trotsky didn't appear at the funeral of, of Lenin, which is many historians later saw this as either a sign or his big mistake. Why did he do that? E.H. Carr, in his book on what is history, has this whole discussion about uh, incidentals in history. And he uses two examples. One is the Cleopatra's nose, the shape of Cleopatra's nose. And if it had been different, then Mark Anthony wouldn't have fallen in love with her, and history would have been different. The other example is, is Trotsky getting sick hunting ducks and not attending the funeral of, of, of Lenin. Um, from the Lakoba archive, we actually see there's correspondence from Stalin and Stalin's people to Lakoba saying, we're sending Trotsky to you, keep him there. <laughs> and he does. So uh, Lakoba, or rather Trotsky was in Sukhumi when, uh, when Lenin died and he didn't come up for the funeral. And sort of those documents are there about how he was encouraged to, keep, to stay there. Apparently, incidentally, uh, Trotsky addressed the announced the death of Lenin from the balcony of what's now the Hotel Vitsa in the center of Sukhumi, but that is sort of beside the point. In any case, that, those documents are um, really uh, unusual for the, Soviet, for the Soviet period to have these original sort of handwritten documents, letters, personal correspondence, correspondence with Stalin as well. Um, and even notes, one of the most interesting notes there is about this, this question of the relationship to Stalin and the exceptional nature of, of Abhazia, and particularly in Lakoba, where uh, Lakoba is being reprimanded by the party for doing these things, for giving concessions to aristocrats, for, for interpreting Soviet Bolshevik laws in a not Bolshevik way. And, and there's a letter from Stalin saying, well, we know, we know Lakoba does these things, and it's not in the Bolshevik way, and he really needs to improve that. 
But it basically lets him off, lets him off the hook. It says, well, we have to, have to understand this, but things will improve, but for now, leave, leave La Koba alone. So this really is this, that's the smoking gun that's most interesting to me, I think. Not about conflict, but about this relationship of Abhazi, about this, this exceptionalness of Abhazi, about the, the way in which at the periphery this republic was able to function in a way that was so different from um, what we assume is the, the way that uh, things were, were done in the Soviet Union. So, I'll end there. If there are any questions, I've talked long enough, I think. Ah, and I should say again, for those who have come in late, again, my point in making this talk was to encourage people who are interested in this history, and particularly those of you who are students of Ilya State University or even just interested persons, uh, to come to the two classes I'm teaching at Ilya State University to have more, if, you, if you're not completely exhausted by now. So one is a lecture on Soviet political history, which will be Monday, Mondays at 6.30, and the other one is about archives, about documents. It's a seminar on primary source research, which will be Saturdays at 2 o'clock. So thank you for your attention. Thank you.